Hey, today we're delighted to be joined by Eric Wilson, the host of IBF's On Demand podcasts. Today, we're going to discuss with him the role of analytics in modern day organizations and what we can learn from his new book entitled Predictive Analytics for Business Forecasting. So Eric, thanks very much for joining us live today from the States. And perhaps just to start off, you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself and also perhaps your role at IBF. I'm excited to uh, be part of this, excited to be part of your, your, your cast as well. Uh, my name is Eric Wilson. I'm the thought leader for the Institute of Business Forecasting. It's actually a global organization. It's a membership organization with over 50,000 members worldwide. And we're specifically about fostering the growth of demand planning, forecasting, predictive analytics, SNOP, and related fields. That's what we do as an organization. One of the things we do is not share knowledge. And that's where I, I'm in. I write some articles. I host a bi-weekly podcast, IBF On Demand. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, wherever you find your podcast as well. So that's a little bit about me. I said I got about 30 years experience, way too many and too many industries and too many different uh, positions, but it allowed me to get to where I'm at right now. Brilliant. And today, Johannes, our topic's all gonna be kind of about analytics, particularly in kind of modern day organizations. Um, I think when we discussed this, you kind of had a bit of a controversial view about analytics and um, what their actual role is. So what's kind of your initial overview? Um, my view in a nutshell is that it's very easy to produce one million numbers per second with a computer, but it's actually very, very hard to produce um, five numbers per day that are worth being read by human beings. And that's a bit, I would say, the, the biggest, biggest challenge with analytics is that how do you come to actually produce anything that is worth the attention of a human being? And my casual observation is that what is currently widespread in companies, especially on the supply chain segment, but not only, doesn't pass this test. And that's, that would be, you know, maybe one, one casual observation. There are many factors into that. So yeah, what are, you, what are your kind of thoughts on this, Eric? I mean, kind of data has been something that has grown an awful amount over the last sort of 20 years or so. Um, would you say that we're now producing too many numbers and actually we're not looking at what's really important? Well, I, I don't think you can make too many numbers, but there is some, there is some credibility is what he's saying as far as finding the right information. Data in a raw form is, is just that. It's raw data. It's the building blocks you can actually start building something with. And that's what you're going to look at, turning that data into information and that information then into insights. That's, I would 100% agree. There are companies struggling getting to that insight piece. But the benefits of getting there far outweigh the you know, cost of the journey to get there. So I think their companies need to start on that journey. Even if they're struggling now, even if they're struggling getting those pieces together, it's a beneficial journey they need to start taking because you need to start developing that raw data that is being collected, that you know, thousands and thousands of, of rows and columns into useful insights for an organization. We can't keep living in the past anymore. We need to start looking forward and finding new insights into consumers, into the economy, especially during times we're facing right now with like COVID and things of that sort. We need to start opening up those insights. Sure. And kind of one of those key insights that we kind of focus on here at Locad is that idea of business decisions. I mean, where is it that these business decisions can really change the way a business operates? I mean, the, the, the thing is that it's, there are several, I would say with analytics, there are several paths where you can lead to, I would say, non-productive, I would say, line of activity or line of thought. And I believe that, uh, you need to have like a very, um, uh, to have, you need a purpose. You need a very practical, mundane purpose that drives, you know, what you're doing with your analysis, with all the numbers, the display and everything. And um, a decision is just something, I mean, that's a, a bit the low cat terminology. It's just something that has like a physical, tangi tangible impact on supply chains. So it's something like a, a purchasing decision, a stock movement, um, a, a price change. So, if you are actually looking at numbers with the direct intent to improve a decision, I would say it can be good. Uh, the, what I usually see is oceans of vanity metrics, where uh, you end up with so many KPIs that it's hardly, I mean, it's, it's almost like an insult to call them KPIs like key 
You know, there is nothing key about them. They are just, <laughs> they, 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 they have just, again, um, ocean of numbers and it's, it's uh, uh, and it, it lacks, I would say, focus. And it lacks, I would say, a, a, a built-in mechanism or built-in intent to turn that into something that is actionable at scale and in ways that are completely automated. Okay, let's talk a little bit maybe about your, your new book, that um, Predictive okay. Analytics for Business Forecasting. It's very much kind of focused at the demand planner. And mm -hmm. what we've kind of noticed in the industry is as these kind of t data teams kind of grow, um, there's more and more kind of impetus on looking for that capable demand planner. Um, would you say that that's something that there's maybe a bit of a short shortcoming of in the industry? No, but also maybe yes as well. And the reason kind of, uh, you know, kind of go back and forth on that is because I, I think the demand planners are capable of growing into the position. They're capable. I mean, they're, they're wired to look at what's impacting the consumers, what's impacting the demand, uh, to understand and make connections with different variables. They're wired to do that. They're wired to communicate that into a supply chain, into finance, into other uh, parts of the organization and make them useful insights that other parts of the organization use. So they're wired that way. So they have the skill sets to do it. That said, right now we are seeing a shortage of demand planners, people that, that because there's such a demand for them now, there's such a, a need in organizations to bring people in that have those skill sets, we're seeing a shortage now. Salaries have gone up anywhere from 30 to 40 percent over the last five years. We're seeing, you know, job boards being filled even during these times with people looking for people with quali you know, qualitative and those quantitative and the communication skills to be able to bring the analytics and business acumen together for an organization. So they have the skill set. So your first question, are they qualified? Yes, they can do it. Is there enough of them out there? The answer would be no. Yeah, and I think that's something we'd probably echo here is we're always on the hunt for well-qualified supply chain scientists and um, it's always something that can be fairly challenging to find. Um, so why is it so hard from your perspective, Johannes? I mean, I mean first, <laughs> pretty much by definition, talent is rare. You know, it's, uh, every single company says we only hire the best, but the reality is the market's just higher the average. So, um, so, so, uh, and, and literally those sort of jobs w are the sort of jobs where people who are better at it get, I would say, disproportional good results. You know, we are entering a game, I mean, that's my own perception is that as you go toward, you know, people that are doing quantitative analytics with real impact for organization, you end up in a, you end up a realm that is a bit similar to the one of quantitative trading in banks where you have a few traders that are going to make the bulk of the return of the bank. And um, so, and I mean, the, the technology just is a, a demultiplier for the human intelligence. So if you have somebody who is smarter, more capable, that has better business insights, they will just do it faster at a larger scale for their organization. And that, that start to be, to, to, to be very, very true for, for, I would say, supply chains as well, not just, you know, uh, trading for, for banking and finance. Now, um, what makes it, I would say, a bit harder than it should be, I believe, uh, on the company side is the idea of the data scientist. And I, I think this, this has been getting very, very popular, the idea of the, the, the data scientist over the last uh, probably five years or so. But the problem is that you end up with people where, that have been told at universities that your focus should be the technology itself. You know, you need to become very, very good at Python. You need to be become very, very good at PyTorch, Keras, TensorFlow. I mean, whatever is the open source, the popular open source toolkit of the day to do machine learning. And the reality is that although it is certainly you know, a requirement to have a certain degree of, 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 uh, of, of uh, I would say, of practice, of, of fluency with technical tooling. Um, it's not a substitute for, I would say, a very, um, a, a very patient understanding of what makes the supply chain ticks, including, you know, the, the minute details that drive an organization, the, the things that are very specific. And yet, if you miss them, you're kind of completely off. And thus, um, what I see is a bit of a struggle of supply chain scientists who have, who have, I would say, 
um, done tons of exercise on models that were, you know, tested and uh, I mean invented and rolled out at companies like Facebook and Google. And then when they arrive in an actual regular company that is not Google, uh, it feels like oh we are doing to do those things, but it's so it's so non-ambitious compared to, to to what I'm seeing on the Google side. And the reality, it's not that it's not ambitious. It's just that the Difficulty is of a different kind. It's not about having like a massive cluster of GPUs where you're going to crunch at petabytes of data because very few companies have petabytes of data. Uh, but it's going to get the fine print of your supply chain analysis very, very right. And that is very difficult, but it's a different kind of difficulty. What are your thoughts on this, uh, Eric? Because uh, your book obviously covers a wide range of different kind of analytical kind of techniques. Um, but would you say that kind of that grounding and that overview is something that's a bit more difficult to achieve? I, I would agree 100%. I think there's, there's, there's different skill sets in that data scientist and the demand printer. There's also a lot they can learn from each other as well. And, and I think that's a great overview of what, exactly what you talked about, some of that struggles that we're seeing. I mean, the demand planner needs to be more based in science. They need to look at things and look at external variables, uh, look at new technologies, modeling, those things that, that are really the data scientist world that they, they are in. Demand planners need to come out of their comfort zone and do more of that. At the same time, though, that collaboration, that being comfortable with ambiguity, those type of situations, communication, correct, you know, all those things that demand planners, I said, are strong skill sets with, those things help them out, and that's where the data scientists need to come as well. So there's really going to be that, that meshing of the two type skill sets going forward for a demand planning role. It, it, there is something unique in a supply chain. There's something unique in, in being able to have a model change daily and being able to adapt to it. There's something unique in supply chain that, that you need to be able to offer uh, from a demand planning role, adding in analytics as another capability inside that as well. And that's really what you're looking to be able to do. Did you want to dive in there, Johannes? I'm wondering if we, if we would not need, uh, I don't know, supply chain scientists or something. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's literally the, the, the made up terminology of LOCAD uh, for this type of position. It's a, it's a bit made up, but it was a way for, um, for LOCAD to literally signal to the market because we received a lot of applicants, I would say especially on the data science side, because it's mostly what produce, you know, I, I would say probably university pr universities produce probably 10 data scientists for every single demand planner nowadays. You know, it has become, it has become you know, uh, um, a, a, a big trend. And, uh, and it was just to kind of put the, the candidates, the applicants in the right mind that they will be first and foremost be doing supply chain, not fancy, I would say, uh, advanced uh, deep learning modeling. And that's a good way to look at it. I mean, it's, the, it's those basic things you need in supply chain, but adding in that, you know, the, the, the probabilistic thinking. Because a lot of people in supply chain, I mean, the way, old way, we were very deterministic. I'm going to sell X number next month, and I'm going to, my whole supply chain around that. We all know that that's not what's going to occur. We need to start thinking more in probabilities, start thinking more in, in ranges, think of more of those risk and opportunities. That's where a supply chain scientist would come in. That's where demand planning helps enable. Those are the things that, really, that companies need to go to. So when you're talking about, you know, you know the analytics is just very beginning, it, uh, analytics kind of, you know, being that buzzword in certain organizations type situation. You can utilize it with the right thinking, right culture inside of an organization and start changing the mindsets of supply chain, start changing the mindsets of an organization to utilize that analytics more as I said, in the systems, the probabilistic thinking, things of that sort. Eric, you sort of said uh, there that sort of data science is something that's becoming a little bit more fashionable, and that's something I think we definitely agree with. It's something that we're hearing more and more about. Um, but how about sort of the supply chain industry itself? I mean, there's so much kind of complexity there. Would you say that's kind of intimidating for someone starting out? Well, personally, I think demand planning sexy. So, I mean, I think that's going to be the next sexy career going forward. So that, that's just me. But, but to that point, I mean, the most recent surveys, because of what we're going through with COVID, when they interviewed CFOs, CEOs, number one, cash flow. Number two is, hey, when's this going to end type situation? Number three, 
demand planning and supply chain was number three on their top of what they're focused on right now. So we've raised, I mean, we're going from the cubicle to the boardroom right now. So there's a lot of attention on supply chain. You're picking up newspapers right now. You're doing you know, TV shows right now where they're talking about supply chain. That didn't happen a few years ago. So the importance of it has, has elevated. With that's going to come people wanting to get into the position and, and really grow that position as well. So is it intimidating? No. I just think it was kind of a back office you know, function that was done and people didn't understand it. People are beginning to not only understand it, but understand the importance of it now as well. Yeah. And one of the things we're sort of seeing a lot is this, particularly when the, the media is reporting on supply chain, they're loving to use all these different buzzwords, but there's not probably so much understanding behind that. Um, would you say that's also something that's maybe a bit intimidating, Johannes, for someone starting out, is the sheer number of buzzwords that are kind of out there? I mean, as far journalists are concerned, I would say the fact that they have a complete lack of understanding of something, as far as I understand the situation of journalism, it has never prevented them to, work, to, to, to literally write tons of stuff about it. You know, the fact that you have no, the, not the slightest understanding should not prevent you, you know, to write very lengthy articles where you have like a, a very opinionated position on the matter. Um, but <laughs> joke aside, um, what I saw is that literally, I mean, that, that's very funny. The generation of my parents, um, and that was a quote from, from my father. He was telling me he, he had been running industrial companies. He was telling me if someone was, you know, um, very reliable and very square in their way of thinking, he would be put on the uh, production side. If you had somebody who was a bit, I would say, very energetic and uh, I would say action oriented, you would put them on the sales side. And if you had somebody who was neither energetic nor reliable, you would put him on the supply chain side. And <laughs> that was a bit like the, the mindset. And, um, but hopefully, I think, and, and literally, um, for, uh, for, for, I would say, it has only come to the interest, I would say, of many universities that supply chain could be of interest, especially, I would say, relatively elite, you know, um, uh, universities, both in the US or in Europe, to start having like uh, supply chain masters that were not complete joke, where it was really, I would say, um, uh, I would say top-notch professors with top-notch students. So this has emerged, I think, over the last, uh, the last two decades. It was a gradual process, but it has emerged. And indeed, there is, I think there is, there is more talent in this industry than ever. But also, I think things have become, I would say, more complicated than ever for plenty of reasons, from compliance to, um, to the globalization that is, uh, that is, with things like COVID, even more complicated than ever. Um, so, so, so it's balancing forces. Okay. Uh, Eric, we sort of almost touched on it a bit there with kind of looking ahead to the future. Um, if we look at things maybe from the, the perspective of a company, how much would you say over the next couple of decades that role of analytics is going to change and how can you see that evolving? Oh, wow. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a huge evolution or revolution over just the next few years. Uh, we're seeing the, the necessity to become more agile, more responsive, more predictive inside organizations. Uh, so with that, organizations are going to have to start keep catching up. They're going to start we're having to rely on more of uh, micro-targeting consumers now. They can't just blanket the airways and blanket uh, you know, the websites on with, with material now. They have to start targeting that to more. That is going to rely on a good demand planning and supply chain to be able to help support those things. So what we're going to see is, is you know, they talked about the democratization of data. We already see the democratization of analytics and that function of supply chain really becoming opposed to that back office support of really across the organization supporting all types of functions going forward. And that's really where I see things going. Uh, things are, we're going to become, we, we've been talking about it for years, but I truly think organizations are going to become a lot flatter and they're going to be more dependent on analytics as really driving those organizations going forward. Yeah. Janice, we already talked about the idea of kind of micro-targeting micro when we were speaking about kind of using loyalty card data. Um, so it's definitely an interesting kind of concept. Um, how about you? What do you kind of see as kind of the future for the, the landscape of tech? Um, I mean, my, 
my perception is that when technology mature, really mature, they tend to become invisible. And it's, it's literally, it blends into the background. And, you know, just, I think, and when it's really perfected, you barely notice it anymore, although it's m more present than ever. The, I think the, the archetype for that would be the anti-spam. You know, you have a piece of advanced machine learning that is sorting your mail all the time. And it's, it's very, very accurate. You know, I mean, if you check your spam box, it's literally, I mean, 99% of it is spam, well classified. And you don't do anything, it just works. I mean, literally, if you've been using, you know, I don't know, uh, Google Mail, you know, Outlook or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the sort of things is that, I would say, very mature technology, especially uh, on, the, on the machine learning side, when done right, they literally, you know, kind of disappear and do their stuff, do it quietly, reliably, without fuss. And thus, uh, you, you kind of forget, you know they're there, you know they're there. Um, you can also, you can keep working on improving them. You can do a lot thanks to that. But uh, it's not such a fuss. I mean, it's nothing, you know, glorious. It's not impressive because it kind of disappears in the background. And, um, and I believe that for many organizations, probably I would say the future of, of, of supply chain analytics tech will probably be like that. So it will be something that is just, um, you know, driving tons of very mundane decisions. It will not necessarily capture the bandwidth of the CEO. You know, um, direct targeting will be done, you know, automatically, just works. Um, uh, smooth, I would say, uh, smoothing the, the, um, uh, the workload of your warehouse, plants, stores, whatever, will also be done in the background. Nobody will necessarily, will, I mean, only a few specialists will pay attention on a day, I would say on a day-to-day -day basis to those sort of things. But nonetheless, um, it will have become an art of, of having people that are very, very good to, you know, remain very competitive and keep improving the, the, the overall, you know, system uh, because it will be, uh, you know, the, uh, the, on, the, on the contrary, lacking this sort of technology will make you so thoroughly uncompetitive that it will not po be possible to survive. Just like if you had, uh, I would say, a mailbox, uh, you know, and uh, nowadays without an anti-spam, you would be spending your entire day sorting out your spam just because when you look at it, you can be quite terrified by the fact that you're receiving something like a thousand, you know, spam email per day. So obviously, you know, without that, you, it would be almost impossible to use the email. It is because you have such a, a good technology. Now, email is not, I would say, a completely um, adequate analogy because um, you can have an anti-spam technology that is completely, I would say, um, uh, that, that, that is literally the same for l literally millions of companies. You know, you can have millions of companies, um, billions of people who are using Gmail or Outlook, and it's literally the same filter that works for everybody. Uh, supply chain is, are way more diverse. So I will not see this, I don't see as, you know, a realistic market position to have like one company, not even low-cad, unfortunately, who just, you know, captures the entire market because it's just too diverse. There are, there are just too many different situations to have like a, 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 a monolith in terms of technology to capture all of that. So there will be still plenty of technology, but my, if I had to guess one thing, I think it will be a much more like, you know, anti-spam. So ambient, mostly invisible, and, uh, and mostly unimpressive, and yet, I would say, more important than ever, you know. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I mean, to that point, you're talking about, I mean, the definition of artificial intelligence is kind of an ambiguous term, but it's anything that automates or, or augments a process or output. And that's what we're pretty much talking about, that thing. It's really going to be less of the modeling, the analytics, the, 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 the technical side of it, more of the soft sides of it. When anything becomes commoditized, something else becomes a premium. So when your data becomes a commodity, when your modeling even becomes commoditized inside organizations because technology can help provide that almost hands off, then what questions to ask becomes the premium or you know how to translate that into you know talking to the CEO, those become the premiums and th that's where you're looking at being on a supply chain, demand planning, those people fitting those goals going forward. So great insights there. 
Yeah, we sort of spoke about it here, this kind of idea of a supply chain being kind of completely silent, and that's kind of the dream. Um, Eric, we'll kind of leave the, the last word up to you. Um, as a final word, kind of what are your hopes for your, for your book, and what are kind of the, the skills you'd like a demand planner to gain from reading it? Yeah, my hope for the book, it's not, it's not a mathy book. Uh, it really gives you the introductions to machine learning, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, it's in the name, predictive analytics for business forecasting, for supply chain, for the demand planner, to help them go from, you know, really that internal data sets, looking back to more of a forward looking, looking at external data sets, looking at new ways uh, they can look at uh, data, look at models that they may not have looked at before. It gives them those introductory pieces. It's separated out between a people, process, analytics, and technology is the way the way the book's laid out. So it, it doesn't just focus on, you know, here's an ensemble, here's the, you know, a decision tree, here's, you know, these models of how you do it. It gives you a little bit of taste of that, but it starts you with the people side of it, how to build a data-driven or analytical-driven uh, organization. It looks at the technology side. What kind of companies help support? What do you need to start building? How do you get that visualization now? And it looks at that data side as well, explaining exactly what data is and how you can start utilizing it inside your organization. Instead of you know just you know swimming in the dip data lake, it really lets you understand how to bring pieces into your organization today that you can use today. And that's really what I hope to be able to do. All right, brilliant. Well, we're gonna have to wrap it up there, but thank you both for your time today. Thank you. That's everything for this week. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again in the next episode. Thanks for watching.